right, so it seems everything is recording correctly, so we'll get started here. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Justin Kissel. I'm the current president of Massa Dearborn, uh, and this is our mechanical PDR, or preliminary design review, uh, for the 2021-22 competition year. Uh, the name of this rocket is Operation Hazmat, or High Altitude Solidification Material Analyzing Test. Uh, to those of you who came to uh, Electrical PDR or our Conceptual Design Review earlier this year, you'll notice the name has changed a bit. Uh, that's because our payload experiment has changed. Uh, we'll talk about that more in the presentation uh, and the reasons for doing so. Uh, but with all that said, we can get started here. Uh, as I said before, my name is Justin. I'm the president, uh, and we'll be going over the presentation. Uh, so an overview of this presentation, um, it's going to be a bit shorter than our last one, uh, than our last uh, mechanical PDR. Uh, so we're going to have just about an hour of all of the subsystems. Uh, we'll have a 10-minute intermission just after the recovery section. Uh, so we'll get up, stretch, do whatever we need, and then we'll come back and finish it out. But we're hoping to be done in about an hour and a half or so, and then we'll have questions. Uh, here's our team member breakdown this year. Uh, this has been updated uh, for all of the recruitment that we've done so far. Uh, so right now we're sitting at about 53 members. Uh, we have 36 men and 17 women. And then the breakdown of majors is included in the table. Uh, you see we've got a lot of mechanical engineers, a lot of electrical and computer. And right now we're trying to recruit more business people. So we're hoping to get more accounting and finance and other business degrees in there as well. Uh, certified flyers. Uh, these are certified for high power rocketry. Some of us have certified with Robert uh, in the call here, and some of us have certified up at LK Airport. Um, Sierra is level two, Kyle is level two certified, and I am as well. Uh, and Alexander uh, and Josh, they're both level one certified. We're also running an L1 certification class. So right now we have 24 people uh, that we are making or that we're having go through the whole process of getting level one certified uh, in addition to some extra stuff that we're throwing in there like an open rocket tutorial basic CAD tutorial uh, and in addition to building the actual rocket uh, so that launch will be next month November 20th and that'll be up at our Clio launch site uh, at LK Airport uh, that's with Michigan team one uh, here's the team structure. Like I said, I'm the president. Our mechanical lead is Sarah Dormal. Our electrical lead is Joshua Hawkins. Our business lead, uh, interim business lead rather, is Sierra Stockwell. Uh, and our safety and launch operations person will be determined closer to our competition date. Uh, as for our competition, we compete in Spaceport America Cup. Uh, the whole objective of the competition is to bring a payload to a target apogee. Uh, the apogee that we try to reach is 10,000 feet. Uh, so we're not trying to go as high as possible, but we're trying to get as close as possible to 10,000 feet. Uh, we are in the 10,000 foot COTS category, which means we buy our motor just through an online or just through a commercial vendor instead of making it ourselves because we do not currently possess the ability to do so. Uh, and our competition is hosted in late June. Uh, this year is June 21st through 25th uh, of next year. And this is all put on by ESRA. And the links to the websites are right there if you'd like to take uh, some time to learn more about the competition. Uh, this was our point breakdown for 2020-21. Uh, this is a bit of a different uh, point structure uh, than the in-person competitions because this was our virtual competition. Uh, we did receive 848.5 points, which is uh, roughly a 100 point increase from our previous year that was in person. Uh, and then here's our projected score that we hope to get uh, put up against the last time that we were in person. So the grading scale sort of translates over. We hope to do similarly on the entry form and progress updates, design implementation, and a bit higher on flight performance. Uh, in our technical report, we plan to score a bit higher than we have in previous years. Uh, last year, we did this and we hope to increase our score again. Uh, one of the biggest factors uh, to this projected score though is the bonus points. Uh, we're hoping to get the 50 points for doing CubeSat, which is what we're designing our payload around, when we'll talk about that in the payload section. And we hope to get the full 100 points for an early launch date, because we want to launch the first day of competition. Uh, some of the team goals of this year, we want to launch that competition and launch that first day of competition to get those 100 points like I was talking about. We want to retain at least 20 new members. Uh, we've got a lot of seniors graduating this year, and COVID put a damper on our uh, recruiting efforts, so we're hoping to get back at it and uh, build up the team to be stronger than ever in the years to come. We'd also like to place top 15 overall. Uh, last year, we placed 22nd overall, so we think this is definitely achievable, and we think that placing top 15 overall will probably get us within the top 10 of our category, which is 10K COTS. And we'd also like to get at least 15 members level one certified, which we're well on the way to doing right now with manufacturing starting this Friday. 
The vehicle architecture, uh, we'll start on the booster side of the vehicle, so the far right. Um, as you know, we fly in a boosted dart configuration, which is almost a two-stage configuration, but the second stage has no motor in it, uh, so it's an unpowered stage. So on the far right, we have our motor at the bottom with airfoil fins. These are static fins. Uh, and just above that, we have the new member payload, uh, which we'll talk about the payload section. Uh, then we have our booster eBay or avionics uh, that control the booster parachute there, because that booster comes down as one vehicle, so that will come down separately than the dart. Uh, then the brake right on the top of the booster parachute. Then we have the deployable fins and air brakes uh, just next to that empty motor tube. Uh, which we plan to fill with a motor for our 30K launch that we plan to do after competition as a test launch uh, for next year, hopefully going to the 30K category. Uh, the air brakes and other avionics are housed in the arm or the air brakes and avionics rotational mount. Just above that is the dart parachute, uh, the camera shrouds, as well as the camera mount, the solidification experiment, uh, which is fully maintained in that CubeSat payload, which we hope to get the 50 points for. And then above that, we have the dark custom GPS and tele GPS. Uh, and then the GPS tracking is in the booster recovery eBay for the booster. Uh, just a rocket comparison between our last rocket and this one. Uh, as you know, we've changed experiments. Uh, instead of the biological experiment, we're using a solidification experiment. Uh, we're building this to be a two-stage design. Uh, so that we can put a motor in that upper stage with the CubeSat payload instead of Von Karman. Uh, we are moving to 6-inch diameter instead of 5-inch. This is to fit that 4x4x12 four by four, uh, by CubeSat payload. Uh, as I said before, 30,000 foot capable. And we're also running a G custom GPS. This is as a secondary GPS. Um, so we're still using the Tele GPS for our competition required GPS. But we're making this one uh, just as a test of our abilities and hopefully to move to it in the future. A summary of our payload, like I said, this is a fairly recent change uh, to chemical solidification from our uh, previous idea with the biological experiment. Uh, so the whole point of this experiment is to analyze the reaction between aluminum and hydroxide. Uh, so on the electrical side of things, we're going to be measuring uh, different sensor data, such as pressure and temperature. Uh, and one of the important things about this experiment is that we can have the team start uh, researching in and start designing valves and valve systems. Uh, which is a fairly complex design, especially building them from scratch, and is used widely in uh, SRAD motor development. As you can see below, um, there's valves to add these separate things, um, or these separate, uh, the oxidizer and the fuel grain together. Uh, this is for a hybrid motor. There's also full liquid motors. Uh, but, you know, in the future, we'd like to look at making our own motor, and making a valve is one of the important things for that. Uh, and then we can see the reaction uh, listed there as well, uh, the sodium hydroxide and aluminum. Uh, and then the product for this reaction is actually a foam. Uh, launch vehicle summary, our vehicle is just under 15 feet long. Uh, and for our motor, we're going to be using uh, motors from Cesaroni uh, for both launches. For the 10K launch, we're going to be using an N1100P. And for the 30K launch, we're going to be using an O3400 in the booster and an M2500 in the dart. And then for those of you who are new for motor classifications, each letter, uh, it goes up in the alphabet. So uh, a, B, A through M, or A through P is roughly what we can use. Um, it doubles each time, the amount of impulse. So an O is quite a bit bigger uh, than an M. Uh, as for our recovery system, we are planning to use a reefed parachute in both the dart and the booster. Uh, this is to save space. Uh, we're also going to be testing this on our launch of Booster Bear the Next Generation, our previous uh, rocket on November 13th. Uh, and then we also plan to put some uh, reefing parachutes on smaller rockets. So, you know, like L1 or level two class rockets um, or level one or level two certification rockets uh, to see if the reefing parachute will work at that size as well. Our overall timeline breakdown, I'll use my mouse here to get us at the, at the right spot. Uh, so we're just after the preliminary design review for mechanical here. Uh, you see we can start major purchasing now as well as we're going to have to implement the design changes that we get from this design review. Uh, our launch for Booster Bear the Next Generation is November 13th, and our new member certification launch is at November 20th. So this launch here for Booster Bear the Next Generation is in Muskegon, and then the CERT launch is in uh, Clio, Michigan at LK Airport. And then we have the rest of our timeline leading up to competition in June. We have our CDR in March, as well as a test launch for this rocket in late February and early March. Uh, so just an update on last year's project. I've been talking about it a bit, Boosted Bear the Next Generation. Uh, I just want to show you guys the amount of work that our team has been doing in addition to designing uh, this next rocket. Uh, 
we've also been manufacturing this previous rocket. So there's a, been a lot of work going on on the team. Uh, but, you know, this has been helping with our designs. Manufacturing always helps uh, your design because sometimes when you're designing, you don't think about how manufacturing could be. Uh, but that's really helped us this year. Uh, so I just have some pictures here that we'll run through. So this is the payload uh, for, our, for our rocket that we're going to be launching in um, in November. You can see the bulkheads. They were all CNC'd out on the, on the CNC mill there with Devin and Dagan. Uh, we have airframe as well that have been doing a lot of work. You can see we have the full rocket uh, able to be stood up on its own. We've been drilling holes and slots using the mills as well as epoxying things together. Uh, and then we have our electrical team on the far left. They're working on manufacturing their boards. Uh, we've got recovery on the far right, manufacturing parachutes. And then I am actually in the center. Uh, I had a launch last weekend uh, of, my, uh, of a rocket running dual deployment electronics, and which was fully successful. Uh, so now I'm starting to work with Robert on getting my level three certification. And with that, I'll hand it off to Sarah. All right. Hello. I'm Sarah Darmel, Mechanical Lead, and I'll just be going over a brief structure of our mechanical team, some systems engineering, um, the conops of our um, rocket's flight, and the mass distribution by breakdown of rocket section. All right. So this is just a breakdown of our mechanical team structure. Um, at the top is myself, um, Mechanical Lead, and then we have our three subgroups, some um, airframe and propulsion, led by Andre Strickrow. And then payload um, led by Logan Kilby, and then recovery led by Alexander Burkhart. And then underneath those is all of our members, including lots of our new members for each of our subgroups. Right. So this is a system engineering of the upper dart. At the very top inside the nose cone is the tele GPS and the custom GPS. Um, they will be mounted above the payload to avoid any ear interference and also to not be connected to the payload. Uh, and then below the payload is a separate camera avionics mount um, that is located here to avoid um, having the camera shrouds cut into any sort of coupler. And then right below where the cameras are and where the payload is will be the parachutes, um, which we have located behind a bulkhead to minimize any sort of shock that would happen from when they're deployed. All right, and this is the system engineering of the lower dart. At the very top of the lower dart, we have the arm, which holds our dart avionics and the air brakes. The arm is the, um, is the, is the avionics and air brakes uh, rotation mount, if you didn't already uh, know, which you'll hear about later. It's a newer system. Um, and then the air brakes in the arm are located at the bottom and to best locate at the center of pressure of the dart. And then below that is the uh, motor tube. Motor tube, I say that, but it will be empty to simulate where one will be. Uh, and then around that is our deployable fins whose, um, whose, light, whose width will be determined by the remainder of the diameter left by the motor tube and our body tubes. <clears throat> and this is just the system engineering of the booster, the very top with parachutes, which will again be located be out behind a bulkhead between the avionics in the, in the booster. Um, we also have the bulkheads there to minimize um, damage and dirt upon landing. And then underneath the avionics and the new member project, um, we have the motor. And at the very end of the rocket, we have the airfoil fins, which will be mounted through slots through the, bulk, through the body tubes and onto the motor tube. All right. And this is just a breakdown of our uh, concept, concept of our operations. Um, to the left, we just have a quick little diagram of the flight of a rocket. And then over to the right is just a number breakdown of what all these events mean. So about at 1A, our motor ignites. And then about around 2A, at about 12 seconds into the flight, we have our dart separation and motor burnout. This happens at about 7,000 feet. And then about 3A, we have booster apogee, which occurs at about a fairly high 10,000 um, feet. And about 25 seconds into the into the um, the flight, 
And then at about 2b, we have dart apogee, which, um, which happens at about 11,000 feet and about 28 seconds into the flight. This number will hopefully go down um, when we do more involved simulations with the air brakes, which deploy at 1b. And then at about 3b and 4a, the respective parachutes of both the DART and the booster will deploy. And then at about 80 seconds into the flight, the DART will land on the ground. And this is a mass distribution um, by rocket section. Uh, and on the left, you'll see just a table that tells you what each um, section of a rocket weighs um, with a total of 78 pounds. And then on the right, we have a part pie chart that just breaks down the percentage of how of of that of each section's mass of the total mass of the rocket. And as you can see, makes sense. The motors um, hold the highest percentage of mass in the rocket, which is then also followed by the upper dart which makes sense because you want those two parts to be the heaviest parts of the rocket to kind of balance each other out when, when the flight starts and stability will go fully. So this is just our um, overall mechanical timeline. Right now, we are at the end of design iteration one, and then we will begin design revisions based on what we hear from this mechanical PDR today. Uh, and then about November 1st, um, we'll be starting big purchases like like Justin said, and then we're going to be starting to work slowly into manufacturing season, which will last to about February 23rd-ish. And then we'll do any other design revisions that we need, final design revisions after CDR. And then we will enter into manufacturing season two after we have our test launch. And then competition at June 21st. Right, and then we'll hand it over to recovery. Sorry about that, technical error on my end. Give me one second here. All right, feel free, Alex. Hello, everybody. This is Alex speaking. I'm going to take you through the recovery slides, this PDR. Hope you're enjoying the weather. Now, if you will, you can follow along with your printed out slides if you have them. Otherwise, you can refer to the right side of the slide to see what we are going to be talking about today. Next slide, please. I'm not going to read through all that stuff. Most of it's just hard numbers and information provided to us by SAC. Some of the numbers that we've reached in simulation and the numbers that we need to deploy at, like the altitudes. But suffice to say, that is a look at what recovery for our DART will look like. And if you look at the next slide, this is what the recovery would look like for the booster. Now, they're very similar this year because we're going to put a reefing system in both, which means there will be a single recovery bay, a single parachute, a same system in both, which will be pretty cool to see. Next slide, please. Now we're going to start out with the Dart Avionics hey. Bay. So I think my mic connected there. And this is Carson Easter. Hey, I'm Carson, part of the recovery team. And I'm going to go over the Dart Avionics Bay for you guys. So the Dart Avionics Bay is critical for our rocket because except it will signal separation charge for the Dart along with other charges. And then it will hold two different altimeters in case one goes wrong for failure. And then the bay's mounts have been integrated into the ch chassis, so we're mounting a whole mount onto the bulkhead this year. And we're looking to get it more compressed, and it's going to be a 3D printed mount. So here's the breakdown. And it's going to hold two 9-volt batteries along with all altimeters. It's going to be able to signal separation for us. And then if you go down to the next slide, here I've labeled out holes for threader rods and holes for wire pathing. The holes for wire pathing aren't actually that big. Um, it just doesn't have the updated CAD in there. They're actually going to be eighth inch holes. 
and then in the top you see nine volt bays the nine volt batteries slide into that bay and then they're held in right along the chassis of the rocket and bottom right we have switch mounts shown there um, to turn on power to the bay and then we will be testing this using e-match signals All right, give me one second before you start, Alex, uh, to try and get this back into presentation mode. It is decided to not like me. I don't think Microsoft Office Suite and browser likes anyone. No, no, you are correct. All right, feel free. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to begin on the DART parachute. We're going to go over its purpose, break down its design, and go over the testing that we are going to conduct. Next slide, please. The purpose of a reefed parachute is to act as both a drogue and a main parachute. It's going to fulfill both of those roles with the same piece of fabric. It does this through the mechanism known as the Massa reefing system. Now, this system allows for that single parachute to actually have two different projected areas at different stages when we choose for them to be. And finally, we have the shock cord, which is going to be made up of tubular nylon webbing that will connect the lower dart to the actual parachute. We're going to have normal one inch nylon webbing that connects the lower dart to the upper dart. Next slide, please. Now to begin, we are going to go with a round eight core pattern parachute like we did this year, like we did the year before that, like we did the year before that, because it just works so well and they're so cool to look at and fold up. Now, we don't know specifically what its major or minor or the projected areas will be yet because we're not certain on how much it will weigh. We have a good idea, but that is completely and totally dependent on how much the vehicle will weigh. We have the templates ready to go and crunch those numbers. And once we do that, we're going to print out a stencil, tape it together, cut out some nylon, and sew it together. Now, the one thing that we do know is what velocities we need to accomplish. Now, the first stage has to achieve a terminal velocity of 30 meters per second, and the second stage has to achieve a terminal velocity of 6 meters per second. These numbers are prescribed to us by the SAC rule book, and we are only abiding by those. They are given in metric as they are given in the rule book, and there is a range given, but that's the number that we're going to shoot for in our calculations. Now, as far as deployment is concerned, it will be actually ejected from the dart recovery bay, and the parachute will assume stage one upon ejection. This is when the upper dart decouples from the upper, the lower dart. After that, the parachute will assume stage two when we choose, when the altimeters signal the tender descenders, which will allow the parachute to unfurl to its full projected area. Next slide, please. This is a design breakdown of the Massa reefing system. Now this consists of tender descenders, a reefing line, and the tubular shock cord. On the right side of the screen, you can see a diagram, a simple diagram of this system. Now to begin, the orange things, the tender descenders, they are an aluminum body with two quick release chains. And by putting a black powder charge into the aluminum casing and blowing it up, it allows one of those quick link chains to be released. This allows us to have this reefing system. Now there are two because there is always one auxiliary for redundancy sake. They're both independently signaled and you may see now there's one reefing line. This is because each of the tender descenders is attached to one side of the reefing line. So if one fails to go off, we still have the reefing line unfurled and the parachute will still be able to reach its full projected area. Now the tubular shock cord simply retains and protects the signal line from the flight from the lower dart. Yeah, I missed that. Sorry. The flight package is now referred to as the lower dart, so ignore that, please. Now the tubular shock cord will retain the lower dart to the parachute, and that's where the signals will go through. There's going to be plenty of slack in there to prevent any stress from hurting the signal lines. Next slide, please. Now we have to do some testing. Now we hope to see this system be successful in our launch coming this November. 
And if that is the case, we will be very happy. We're also going to have to do some ejection testing because we just have to do that. We're going to play around with the tender descenders and see what we can do to make them fail. Next slide, please. Now we're going to go over the booster parachute. This will be a little bit quicker because it will be identical to the one that I just described. Next slide, please. Now, the only difference about this parachute is it will be a slightly different size because the booster will weigh less than the dart, most likely, and it will go and reside in the booster recovery bay before it is shot out, but everything else is the same. The only difference between this and the other system is that this booster does not have an additional length of nylon webbing to attach to any other part because the booster is the booster. There is only one. There's not a lower and an upper. It will stay intact once it decouples from the dart. Next slide, please. Now, this slide may seem familiar to you. It's because it is. Now, the only difference between this slide and the dart slide will, that, will be that the major diameter, the spill hole diameter, and the projected areas will be different. They're going to be smaller than that of the dart because the booster will weigh less than the dart. And, of course, it's going to be packed in the booster recovery bay. And same deal as the other one. Stage one is its stroke stage. Stage two is its full stage. Next slide, please going to do some ejection testing with the booster to make sure the isolation bulkhead is in working order. Next slide, please. I'm going to give it up to Jamal, who's going to present the booster avionics bay. Hi, I'm Jamal. So for the booster avionics bay, we're going to go through the purpose, design, breakdown, and testing. Next slide. So for the purpose, the booster avionics bay holds the tailor GPS, the secondary custom GPS, the altimeters as well as the batteries for powering each. And the altimeters will signal the ejection and reefing charge for the booster parachute. Next slide. So for the design breakdown, the chassis is gonna be 3D printed with all of the battery mounts integrated. And the caps in blue and orange are gonna be separately printed. So next in green, we have the signaling altimeters for the booster parachute systems that will be mounted using standoffs. And in yellow, there's the Tele GPS and the secondary custom GPS that will track the booster. Next slide. So here's a better view of it. Um, in green, we have the two RRC2 plus altimeters, the Tele GPS and the secondary GPS, the safety switch mounts, and the LiPo and 9 volt battery mounts that are integrated. Right, next slide. So for testing, we're gonna do an altimeter test to make sure the parachute deploys well. And um, we expect them to be deployed with the proper timing. And that's gonna be scheduled for March of next year. Hello again. I hope you didn't miss me. Now I'm going to go over the charges and shear pins, which are a periphery part of our rocket, but a flight critical one. Next slide, please. Now the purpose of these two things are as described below, and they're pretty basic concepts, so I'm not going to beat them into the dirt. The charges we use are black powder burritos. This is pretty standard and sounding rockets. Now this consists of a piece of duct tape, as you can see depicted on the right. We put a fireworks e-match into it, put some black powder that we measure into it. We make sure that the e-match is touching the black powder. We wrap it all up and we put it where it needs to go. The shear pins are nylon shear pins. We know what will make them go undergo shear failure. We take the cross-sectional area of each one that we have and find out what force is required on the associated bulkhead to shear them all. And that's how we choose shear pins and quantities of shear pins. Next slide, please. The charges we use, as I said, are 4F black powder. And the way we determine how much we want to use is by using the ideal gas law and its derived relationships. Now you can see all the variables that we use in our Excel template. There are some other considerations, but we don't really have to worry about most of them, except for the one that we do need to test every theoretical size charge. We need to make sure that it actually will do what 
the math says it will do because the real world is not ideal. It's not perfect. There's friction and all that. So we will need to verify all of those numbers, but we reach our conclusion through the ideal gas law. Next slide, please. The shear pin analysis, as I have already a little bit described, is done through basic statics. You can see all of the equations that are relevant on the right side of the screen. We take all of these and there is another Excel template that we use for this to make it easy to find out what size nylon shear pins and how many of them we will need in any configuration. Right now, we're going to go with a certain amount of 440s, probably four. Next slide, please. And like I said, we will need to do ejection testing. We need to make sure that each charge in each instance is sized correctly. So we'll need to make sure that it will actually make the shear pins fail. Next slide, please. All right. Now, I originally had an intermission scheduled, but we have only been presenting for half an hour. So I think that we're just going to power through um, unless anyone has any, uh, any objection. We can have a five minute intermission if anyone would like. Speak now or forever hold your peace. All right, the peace will be held. We will continue straight to airframe. Go ahead, Andre. Uh, hello, I'm Andre, and I'm airframe and propulsion lead. And uh, on the right, you can see our project. Uh, we have general airframe, deployable fins, air brakes, airfoil fins, and uh, our new system, uh, avionics and uh, air brake rotational mount. So next. So uh, your general airframe, uh, John, will you please? Yep. Uh, I'm going to be presenting the general airframe, and then Andre will be pre presenting the open rocket analysis, and Hunter will be presenting the camera shrouds. Next slide. So the purpose of the general airframe is to encompass and protect the rocket's internal systems, and it's meant to supply the rocket with lift and maintain stability of the dart after separation. It provides an aerodynamically stable flight profile. And this airframe is consisting of a nose cone, bio tubes, and static fins. Next slide. Here's a design breakdown of the CAD. On the right, we have the nose cone, which is connected to the upper dart. And a coupler attaches the upper dart to the lower dart, as well as a coupler connecting that lower dart to the up upper booster and a coupler connecting the upper booster to the lower booster. Next slide. For the bi tubes in the nose cone, the airframe will consist of Kotz von Karman nose cone and four body tubes. The inner diameter of the uh, bi tubes will be six inches. And the coupling tubes uh, will extend one body caliber on either side of the joint between the 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 upper and lower dart, the lower dart and the upper booster, and the upper and lower booster. And on the right side, there is a table showing the lengths of each component. Next slide. And give it back to Andre to present the analysis. So, hi again. And uh, here you can see a broad flight analysis done on open rocket. And uh, so far, our apogee is. Uh, a bit over 10,000 feet, uh, 11,000, uh, but uh, we will have air brakes uh, to slow us down to go to 10,000. And flight time is uh, 80.7 seconds. Uh, our max velocity is uh, uh, 248 meters per second. Max acceleration is 116 meters per second squared. And uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, for our stability analysis, uh, competition requires that uh, our range is uh, from 1.5 to 6 uh, and uh, our uh, stability before motor burnout is uh, from 2 reaching 5. You can see it on a graph on the right, on the top graph on the right. And stability after motor burnout is 2.8 to 2.9 uh, uh, and you can also see it on a bottom right left of the graph. Next slide, please. 
So here is a, a model of uh, uh, our open rocket. Uh, and uh, on the top, you can see the uh, two stages together. And on the bottom, you can see uh, uh, only sustainer stage. Uh, and uh, he, the red point uh, is center of pressure and blue point is center of gravity. And you can see that uh, our center of pressure is where the air brakes are. and. Uh, we uh, specifically designed the rocket so the our center pressure is there next hunter you can continue hi i'm hunter uh the camera shrouds are attached to the center of the dart body tube and they protect the cameras and cause minimal aerodynamic drag on the airframe uh, the shrouds are four inches in length and one and a half inches wide uh, we're also considering making the shrouds smaller and more curved to cause even less drag on the airframe. Next slide. Uh, the camera shrouds will be made from carbon fiber using the vacuum bagging method, and we and we'll have an acrylic window epoxy to the inside of the camera shrouds for additional structural support and to protect the cameras. Uh, we are also going to have a forty-five degree mirror attached to each camera shroud that the camera points at to see downwards. Next slide. Give it back to Andre. Uh, yeah, and here uh, for testing, uh, we can't really test our general airframe. Uh, we will test it during our test flight on March 5th. And uh, we will also test the connection between general airframe and oil, uh, uh, airfoil fins. Uh, and uh, we will also do stress testing on camera shots to, uh, to see uh, how, how strong they are. So, the, uh, we expect no fracture, no deformation. Okay, next. Hello, my name is uh, Barnabas Tooth, and this is the deployable fins uh, system. Next slide, please. Um, so the purpose of the deployable fins is to stabilize the upper stage uh, of flight. Um, so uh, one of the issues that uh, uh, is an issue of this system is the rigidity because the body of the rocket has to be very very rigid around the middle of where the greatest bending load is and um, the deployable fins requires slots to be cut um, at the in the body um, so uh, this is to be resolved with um, a stiff mounting of the motor tube to the frame um, so that the motor tube takes some bending load during the flight um, so we simulated that the fin system um, with the in the thirty thousand uh, 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 feet uh, category is unable to stabilize the flight. However, um, in the ten thousand feet category, we are perfectly fine. The reason for this is that uh, the the motor in the upper stage um, significant, significantly shifts the center of gravity back. Um, so we need a lot more stabilization. Um, the reason why we are still uh, committed to um, doing this system this year uh, for the ten thousand feet category is to um, uh, is to learn uh, uh, various things like whether this um, linear spring system uh, is is uh, better than the uh, um, than torsion springs that we've applied in the past, and uh, I will talk about that. Um, so, uh, in the thirty thousand uh, uh, feet uh, flight, uh, we will uh, uh, use the slots that were cut in the uh, body tubes uh, for the deployable fins to mount uh, static fins, and that's how we will achieve stabilization there. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so like I mentioned before, instead of torsion springs, uh, in, like in previous designs, um, like last year's design, uh, we will use um, linear springs, uh, extension springs to be specific. Um, these will have hooks in the end, which will be um, uh, much easier to attach. And the whole system will be much easier to manufacture as the fin holder arms, um, the, the well, I will talk about it, the manufacturing. So, um, right. So, as you can see, the fins are a lot um, uh, uh, le like they are only one inch in cord length. Um, but this will still stabilize our flight, as uh, uh, was demonstrated by Open Rocket. And uh, uh, as you can see, we will have uh, a sheet metal ring attached to the motor tube. The motor tube continues to extend upward. This picture is not um, doesn't have the whole motor tube in it. Um, it will continue to extend upward and uh, uh, the ring will be epoxied into place. Next slide, please. 
All right. Um, so the bottom uh, plate of the system is going to be um, the ring is going to be CNC'd. Um, actually, can you uh, press the next slide arrow? Just thank you. And a couple more times. A couple more. Right, just so we have everything. Right, so, um, uh, right, right. So the, the bottom plate uh, is going to be um, a single piece of uh, aluminum CNC um, 6061 to be specific. Um, the fins are going to be 7075, and uh, the, these um, little fin holder arms are also going to be 6061. So the fin holder arms will be uh, mounted with fasteners. Uh, and the bottom plate will have pre CNC slots for it. So the positioning is not done with the fasteners, the positioning is done with the, with the slots. Um, right, and the, the ring that will be epoxied uh, onto the motor tube will undergo heat expansion analysis and the, um, the mounting of the um, uh, expansion springs to, the, to this ring is going to be done by simply um, cutting uh, the sheet metal ring at specific places, folding little tabs out and that, well, drilling holes in specific places and then folding these little tabs out. Um, so that should, um, we expect that to be a uh, very uh, simple and, and easy process. All right, next slide, please. So the um, uh, stability analysis done with open rockets showed that um, uh, our flight should remain stable. Um, you know, uh, we should drop under um, under two, a uh, couple seconds before apogee, which is expected, and we should never drop under one uh, caliber. Um, right, so um, a couple more things that are yet to be done is heat expansion al analysis, like I mentioned. Um, we understand that's very important. Um, if this ring mounted um, design is to, uh, is to function, and um, obviously we will have to use heat resistant epoxies um, to do this. And, um, in order for like not so not that many stresses or not as much stress is accumulated in this ring, um, there will be solid work stress analysis on it, and also um, we will use CFD um, to uh, figure out if any any wakes from the air brakes reach the fins uh, and can interfere with stability, like we have done um, for uh, well last time. All right, next slide, please. So there are a couple of tests uh, that we plan. Um, uh, shock absorption testing, multiple drops from um, well, about the height of three feet, um, many openings, um, and we will also measure fin uh, uh, opening time or fin changing time. Sorry, um, because competition requires that the fins be um, uh, removable. Um, well, it can get us uh, more points if if the fins uh, can be switched because they are a part that is prone to damage. Um, and uh, there will also be reliability tests. So um, if the uh, system is heated up, so if everything expands and under perhaps uh, dirty conditions, um, like um, the sand in, in New Mexico, where the competition is, um, we will still want uh, the fins to function reliably. And these tests uh, are um, scheduled to be completed in February. Next slide, please. Hello, um, I'm Alia and I will be presenting about the air brakes. Next slide, please. So we have some sad news. Unfortunately, the only laptop that housed the hazmat air brake CAD um, was in a freak accident where this, a, a, a ceiling fell onto it. <laughs> so um, the CAD is currently still in the process of being made. It's taking a while since I don't have access to a laptop with SOLIDWORKS anymore. So that's unfortunate, but we still have all the other information pertaining to it. So we should be good. Next slide, please. So our objectives for this year's air brakes are to have a system that can extend and contract the blades to bring the rocket as close to the target apogee as possible. Um, it should be located at the center pressure of the dart, or it'll tear the rocket apart. Um, we're going to work to minimize the frictional forces on the blades and minimize the weight of the system. And um, as per SAC rules, we need to have a mechanical locking mechanism. And the electronics mount is going to be redesigned by a new member. On the right is last year's design. So that's the one we're currently manufacturing. Um, next slide, please. 
So for the system model, um, this is an example of our desired design, except um, we'll have four blades this year, but um, like the weight reduction features, um, that, that's kind of what we want. And in the picture on the left, you can, oh, sorry, on the picture on the right, you can see what those weight reduction features will look like. That's the bottom plate, the top, like looking at it down. <laughs> so the top view, essentially, without any mechanism inside of it. Next slide, please. So um, here is the component deep dive of the mechanical locking mechanism. Um, it's going to be uh, extension springs mounted to each blade each individual blade so that um, if the motor loses power, the springs will retract each blade. Next slide, please. So there would be four blades this year, as I said earlier, due to there being four deployable fins, right? We don't, not, we don't want to cause any weird wakes in the airstream. Um, each blade will have the capacity to be ejected one inch out of the body tube. Um, and the deploy mechanism will remain the same as last year, which is um, a disc connected to the blades uh, with these aluminum levers, as you can see here. Um, and the disc is spun by a stepper motor that will extend and contract them on command. So this right here is the bottom plate with the full uh, deploy mechanism inside of it. So all the parts will be CNC'd from 6061 aluminum, except the levers. Um, those will be manually milled, and then the 3D mount will be, uh, sorry, the electronics mount will be 3D printed. Next slide, please. Hi, I'm Sean, and I'll be presenting the airfoil fence. Next slide. So the purpose of this system is to provide stability during the first half of the flight of the rocket. Uh, before the booster breaks off. The airfoil fins are the static fins of the base rocket, and uh, this will help the general airframe by adding stability in the flight. Next slide, please. Design breakdown. So the design of this fin is a supersonic airfoil to account for the high speeds of the rocket. It uses a trapezoidal shape and has tabs that we will use to epoxy the fins to the motor tube. And the edges will be made of sheet metal to ensure the fins do not get damaged during recovery. Next slide, please. This is, here's a full CAD image. Next slide, please. And manufacturing. The manufacturing will be much, so very similar to the camera shrouds we did this current year, where we created a 3D printed mold and used carbon fiber and epoxy to create the fin. And we will also need to manufacture a fin jig to hold the fins in place while they dry after being epoxy. Next slide, please. And here's the testing. Um, we will be doing shock testing where we are dropping it from a uh, certain height to generate the same force that it will see when it is uh, draw, uh, falling from air. Uh, we'll have our test launch in March and we'll also do some strength testing uh, where we're going to apply the for force to the fins after they are epoxy to the rocket to make sure they don't snap off. And next slide, please. Hello, I am Meryl Beth, and I will be presenting the Airworks and Avionics Rotational Mounts. Next slide, please. The purpose of this mount is to provide access to the avionics for the airbrakes while maintaining the structure of the frame. As you can see on the right, the system contains a top disc, a bottom disc, and a key which is in the center, and then two spring-loaded pins which keep the key from rotating freely. The system will be designed around mounting the air brakes and the avionics. Next slide, please. So as you can see on the right, there is the bottom disc, which has a slot around to allow the key to rotate. You can click on the slide again. And which will rotate the key from a position to be locked in where it will be for flight and then being able to rotate to be able to remove the key. And next there's the top disc, which has a single orientation position to be able to remove the key. And when it's the key is in its flight position, it will the tabs of the key will be underneath the top disc. And next is the key which is between the two plates which is it rotates in the center of the arm which 
has the locking ability and will be where the air brakes will be mounted to, which will also be able to be removed to access the avionics. And lastly is the spring-loaded pin, which will be able to be as mechanically loaded, so it will always be in the in position, but has a slant on it, so the key will be able to just push past it and lock into its flight position. Next slide, please. So for testing, the locking mechanism will be tested to make sure that it will hold the key in place. And so the key will be retained in the flight position. And this is scheduled to be completed in February of next year. Next slide, please. Hey, I am Logan Kilby. I will pre be presenting for payload with Bethany Sloan. Next. Uh, our payload will be separated into five different sections. At the bottom, we'll have the camera. Moving up, we'll have the experiment. Then we'll have the board stack and our space three mount, which will be followed by the battery mount and the tele GPS slash custom GPS will be on the top. Next. Uh, the payload will be in the CubeSat configuration and will house the flight data electronics as well as the experiment. Our flight uh, during flight will monitor the conditions of the rocket uh, visibly with the use of cameras mount camera mounts below the main CubeSat payload. Um, the payload will have two GPSs. Uh, one will be our primary GPS, uh, the tele-GPS, and we'll have a secondary GPS uh, that will be our custom GPS. Uh, next. Uh, the frame will consist of four ribs welded to four separate bulkheads. Each bulkhead will have wireways milled into them. Um, all the mounts will be secured to the ribs to allow for easy installation um, as opposed to mounting them to the bulkheads. Uh, the frame material will be aluminum with the possibility of using a heavier material uh, to meet uh, weight requirements. The camera mount uh, will be done in a similar way to this frame. Uh, next. Uh, our camera mount will use will, will be separate from the main payload with its own frame and electronics. Uh, it will be 3D printed out of PETG and will mount the cameras facing outward from the rocket with a mirror mounted uh, in our camera shroud that will enable us to get the proper angle. Next. Uh, our tele GPS will be used in addition to the custom GPS. Uh, this will ensure we, we know the position of the rocket for recovery. The mount will be 3D printed out of PETG and will have its own electronics and power supply. Um, the assembly will mount to the CubeSat payload using four 440 screws just on the top. Next. So, as Logan mentioned, I'm Bethany, and I'll be going over the experiment. First, we have the mount where a solidification reaction will take place. This mount is focused on the manufacturing of a valve to have controlled flow of the reactants into the reaction chamber itself. This is similar to a liquid or hybrid motor in the sense that a reactant is being added through the valve. One goal of this is to lead to where we can be producing our own motors. We'll be able to research um, valve systems, which is important for motor development. Next slide, please. So as for the experiment itself, it's based on a precipitation reaction where aluminum hydroxide is produced in a solidified state. There's many reactions where this is possible, but we're focusing on the reactants of aluminum sulfate and sodium bicarbonate, though sodium hydroxide and aluminum is another great example. The reason we chose this is because of the thermodynamic principle called Le Chatelier's principle, which basically demonstrates chemical equilibrium with changes in many factors, but we're focusing on pressure in relation to our re reactant chamber. Um, this reaction is also seen in a foam-based fire extinguisher, and we believe it'll provide beneficial data towards valve development research, as well as the chemical process itself. Next slide, please.
I think you're muted, Bethany. Sorry, it's me. Um, Go ahead. We, we plan to run two tests, one being to make sure our chambers can contain the reaction, and the other test being to make sure uh, our valves function as intended. Next. Uh, now we'll go over the new member payload. Next. Uh, the purpose of the new member payload is to allow the new members to have more opportunity uh, to design and get their hands or and get hands-on experience. Uh, our experiment was chosen to give new members experience uh, with challenges that the main payload experiment will present. Uh, this allows us to do more difficult experiments that we weren't able to do this year. Um, and we, we plan to design this in a way that is simple enough that anyone without experience uh, can, uh, can help design. Next. Uh, the new member payload will be a maximum of 8 inches tall and will be in the CubeSat configuration. Uh, this payload will house its own electronics, which will be required for the experiment and all necessary mounts. The experiment team is tasked with finding four different ways to house liquids. The experiments and pressures will all be monitored separately during flight as well. Next. Uh, this is our timeline. We are currently in our initial design training phase and are moving into having our first design iteration complete. Next. Uh, testing for the new member payload includes general functionality tests and frame welding tests, which we also plan to do these with our main payload as well. But those weren't included in those slides. Uh, next. All right, and then I'll just be going over some risk analysis of our um, projects in the rocket. So this is just a, a risk analysis um, matrix, just a little breakdown of the probability versus impact of each of our um, risks that we have come up with that could potentially um, the rocket could potentially face. As you can see, there are a few that are in the green, so probably not to worry about too much. A few in the yellow, and then we have one in the um, in the orange slash red. That could be a big problem if it does happen. All right, then next slide. So this is just some recovery risk analysis. Um, one of the biggest risks that we can that we see here on this one would be separation failure. But our mitigation plan for that is a, an exo auxil having auxiliary charges. And then we could potentially have a booster main failure, the booster parachute main failure, but we will also be triple checking the integration. Next slide. Right. And then we could, again, like in the first point, we could have a par parachute failure in the dart or um, potential reefing failure in the in the dart, but we will again be triple checking integration and we plan to fail open using the triggers for that. We, we have a, we've come up with each of the risks that the rocket can come up with for recovery, but we also have a mitigation plan for each one of those that we hope will um, take hold and Cause the not cause these not things to be cause this to be things not to be wor to worried about. Next slide. Here's some more um, recovery risk analysis. There could be potential avionics failures, especially in the the, the dab and the bab. But we will of course be mitigating that with testing and with sampling holes um, in the avionics, particularly. And then there could also be a descent tangle. Um, but we will need to ensure that the shock cord is long enough for that, and we will be double tricking that even more. Next slide. Right, so this is some payload risks. 
Um, there could be a potential failure of the experiment, the um, solidification experiment, not, and they can potentially be affected by the temperature, but we plan to use lots of insulation for that if we as needed. Uh, and then there is potential for sand or dirt to enter the switches, but we will be testing that before and we will be using pressurized uh, air canister. And then also there's a potential for the any of the 3D prints in any of the rocket to what warp, but this is slightly, this is one of our least, this is, this is not a potentially large issue. Um, and we have been using a filament that will is more heat resistant to to withstand that kind of um, cooking in the New Mexico sun. Next slide. All right, some more payload risk analysis. Um, there's potential that the uh, mounts could detach from the frame, and we will be double checking this with with screws and also double checking it with like an integration checklist. But then also this isn't too high of severity of an issue because even if the items are inside, they will be moving around and they could be damaged, but it will not, um, potentially could not uh, over -effect, affect the overall flight of the rocket if it is, well, mitigated. Um, and there's potential for frame welds breaking, but we will be um, weld testing and we will be doing a having a back backup payload frame for when we do um, testing um, launch. Excellent. All right, so now we're into airframe risk analysis. Um, there's a potential that the static fins could fall off or break off. Um, we will be letting those harden for a long time. And as General Airframe said, we will be doing testing on the connections after they are connected in epoxy. And then there's potential that the arm could be secured. And we will be doing some shock testing of the rotation connections. But then again, if the arm is disconnected in flight, the severity is not as high as it um, is not as high because it will still be inside the rocket, um, but it could still potentially be a problem, but we have a plan for it. Next slide. All right. There could potentially be no rocket separation, which could be a big problem, especially when our when it comes to the parachute deployment. And we will be checking, double checking the separation charges. Then there's also potential for um, if it separates prematurely, which will, again we will be checking the separation charges. There is also a potential for motor failure, but we will be buying a reputable motor, a new fresh motor from a reputable source. So the potential for that is down. Next slide. Um, and then the fins, any of the fins, the deployable fins and the static fins could be improperly angled, but we will be using a fin jig and checking the fin angle before these things are solidified into place. Um, there is a potential that the and the deployable fins or the air brakes could not open, and this could also be caused by the fiberglass brace that will be around them. And we will be doing testing and using strong springs for both, and we'll be doing secondary. Fiber, we'll have a secondary fiberglass bulkhead if this uh, the original ones breaks, or if it is manufactured improperly and causes blockage of these systems. Next slide. All right, and then some more specifically air brake um, risks. The bleeds um, could move by themselves, but for that we have a limit switch and springs, and the there is a potential that the blades do not move, do not open due to no friction. Um, and we will be co correctly, we will double check, double checking the correct the calculated tolerances and the lubricant that we used on on those air brakes before we launch. Next slide.
All right. You know, when you hear my voice again, we're in trouble. Uh, but no, uh, we're done with all of the subsystems presentation. So now I've got some project management stuff and Sierra will talk about our financials and then we'll open up for questions. Uh, so I'll go over uh, design completion first here. Uh, so you can see our total design completion is at 66% uh, with, you know, still manufacturing that other rocket. Uh, we're in a similar place to what we were last year uh, for design completion uh, with our payload frame, general airframe, airfoil fins, and avionics phase being just about done. Uh, the only things that have uh, yet to get up to that 66% completion, uh, the solidification experiment and mount, uh, like I said before, and like some other people have stated, uh, this was a new change. Uh, so this will be starting to be worked on and be done uh, on a quicker timeline than normal. Also, the air brakes, they're not actually at 0%. Uh, they're a bit higher than that uh, because we are remaking the CAD as we speak. However, when the ceiling falls down, uh, we cannot control the ceiling falling down. Uh, may your laptop rest in peace, Alia. Um, so we have about 133 hours left to completion. And then I'll note for general airframe uh, with the five hours remaining, uh, this does not include simulations. There's still many more simulations to go. As for Project D-Scope, just some of the things that we've uh, cut or talked about uh, and changed designs on so far this year. Uh, first, I know that in uh, the Conk DR, uh, we talked a lot about the deployable fins. Uh, we were debating doing airfoil and also the off-center opening fins. Uh, we decided to cut this as, you know, we talked about inducing a lot of roll and little benefit that that airfoil would give on such a small fin there. Uh, and the, it wouldn't be as strong as the airfoil fins are now or as the uh, deployable fins are now, sorry. Uh, so now we've just decided on those standard rectangular fins that you've seen, and they're on axis to the rocket. Also, the biological experiment, this was changed to the chemical experiment now for solidification. Uh, this was changed for a couple of reasons. This was something that Payload was uh, more passionate about doing, and this will give us future research opportunities. This will give us good data for future flights, uh, like we've talked about before with uh, studying valves and pressure chambers uh, as related to motor research. And the alternative here is the solidification experiment. And the air brakes and avionics rail mount, I know we originally talked about it being mounted on rails. Now it's the rotational mount that we discussed uh, extensively in conceptual design review uh, and that we've designed for this PDR. Uh, so now it is the air brakes and avionics rotational mount. Now on to Sierra. Hello, I'm Sierra Stockwell. I'll be taking you through our financials today. We'll start with a budget overview, then our justification, funding sources, and a thank you to our sponsors. So here's our budget overview. As you can see, our budget has increased a lot since the previous year when we were able to request money from the university. There are a few reasons for that that we've previously mentioned, um, building this rocket to go to 30,000 feet and bring more members to um, competition are a few of those. So this year we are proposing a budget of $57,000 compared to our previous budget of a little under $30,000 um, for an increase of 193.44%. Next slide. Our justification, again, we are planning to bring 40 members to competition instead of the previous 20. Even before when we had around 30 members, bringing only 20 members was very difficult. There were a lot of hard conversations around that and deciding who wouldn't be able to come even though they had put a lot of work into the rocket. So this year we plan to bring 40 members to competition. Housing and gas price has also increased um, due to the pandemic and time since our last trip out to New Mexico. And our 30K launch in Kansas after competition will mean more motors, which are one of the most costly parts of our rockets, and more travel costs. Again, we would like to bring around the same amount of members to that launch so everyone can see what goes right and what goes wrong in that 30K launch so we can improve for the next year. We also have a new member certification class that is taking up funds that we previously have not um, allocated to this sort of class, but it is going very well. This picture on the side is an image of our new member class going on. We have 24 people getting L1 certified, which will be great. In the past, we've had one member certified and now we have um, five members, L2 and L1 certified, so that's great, but 
improving that number will improve our entire rockets for the years to come because members will have a much greater understanding of rocketry. Next slide. So our funding sources for this year, we have requested $30,000 from CCS, which we expect to get, and we will find out about later this week or next week. We have received $20,000 from the Woods Foundation, and we have also already um, been uh, given or will be given $20,000 for next year through this foundation. Um, we basically proposed $40,000 over two years, so that funding is secured for next year as well. Um, so that will be good for moving to 30K next year. Ford Motor Company has graciously donated $5,000 to us. Magna is planning to donate $2,000 to us soon. And we project to uh, fundraise $3,000 from Giving Blue Day for a total of $60,000. As you can see, even without Giving Blue Day, we have raised the total amount that we expect to spend this year. And we plan to propose more sponsorships with multiple companies outside of these um, just to open up opportunities for us to expand even more, maybe do an L2 certification class with all of our L1 certified members from this class next semester if possible. And we would also like to look into equipment that could improve our manufacturing in the future, um, like to be able to make our own body tubes with a filament winder. Next slide. We'd also like to give a thank you to our sponsors. We use SolidWorks and our sponsored licenses through them. We are also obviously funded by the College of Engineering and Computer Science here at U of M Dearborn, the Woods Foundation, Ford, the Rousey family, Magna, and we get a nice discount on our cut all manufacturing. All right, and that concludes the presentation part of the uh, of this uh, preliminary design review. So we'll open up for questions. Um, we'll do a similar thing to what we did in conceptual design review, where I'll just go down the list uh, and I'll see what sort of questions everyone has. I know Dr. Ratz, you sent me a question already, uh, and then I can answer that once it's uh, once we're at your turn. Uh, so let me take a look at my list here and see who we've got. I will say, um, Barnabas, are you still here? Because if so we need questions yes. for the deployable fins first oh yes that's true um so yes i'll open it up for the deployable fins um any questions on that system before barnabas has to uh, head out a bit early tonight i do apologize i have a exam starting shortly <laughs> robert or bob anything on deployable fins I just wanted to ask real quick, maybe it's just because uh, this is my first time seeing your presentation, um, but is have you considered uh, static fins as well? Is there a reason they need to be deployable rather than always um, externally mounted? Um, yes, so um, the reason why we um, pretty much always did a uh, deployable fin system is because we were planning to do, go, go to the 30K uh, category uh, because um, over that long of a flight time, the deployable fin system can provide a more efficient flight because there is no drag before they are deployed. In the 10,000 feet category, unfortunately, that's pretty much impossible, but we were always practicing for the um, 30,000 uh, feet category. So <laughs> I know that now that we are finally, uh, we have finally reached that point, we cannot use this system uh, there, uh, but um, uh, we, we just don't have the manufacturing capability this year because there are so many launches. Yeah, I think I'll I'll add on to that. Uh, we hadn't thought of changing to static fins because, as Barnabas said, we were using uh, deployable fins to go to 30k. Uh, but now that we can't use them for 30k, that'll definitely have to be a decision we have to make. Uh, yes. So, so in case I wasn't clear about that, yes, for so for 30k flight, we are planning to use static fins. Got it. Yeah, it just seemed like you had some from your simulations had some additional height that was coming out of uh, your motor. So yeah, maybe you can afford the drag uh, and sim simplify somewhat. But yeah, good thoughts. 
you asked about questions on the, I, I didn't actually until I heard your answer about um, the 30K flight. You're going to have a different dart at Kansas than you have in New Mexico? Um, not quite. So we are just using the, the exact same dart and then um, using the slots cut for the deployable fins to mount uh, static fins uh, there. There was also an idea of um, replacing that section of the body tube and just have that section removable. That's a decision that we haven't made yet, um, but that's also an idea that came up. Yeah, the, the idea that we that I, we were just thinking of, Robert, was of a fin can uh, for the second stage that's uh, removable and replaceable with a static fin uh, mount. Yeah. And to be honest, Century 30K flight isn't part of the competition. You're free to do whatever you want, but just that's a real challenge. You're talking about some enormous flight forces on a you're putting that up on an O motor. So you're going to be at the peak of your aerodynamic forces when you deploy your um, your dart. And that's going to take some real careful engineering to be able to make that easily swappable and still strong enough to take the kind of forces you're talking about. But hey, have at it. it, it again, it doesn't change the contest. So good for you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so then would you su suggest that a better alternative might be to take the deployable fins out because the system will be removable uh, and to just yes I absolutely would think that static fins for both flights would be the best choice for you but I appreciate you guys like to make these things complex and if you want and you have been able to make the deployable fins work in the 10,000 foot launch so if you want to try that again for the contest this year I can understand your desire to do that because you put quite a bit of time into setting these up and if you want to use them I get that but your your chances of having successful flights both in New Mexico and Kansas go up dramatically if you simply stay with static fins for both flights. Okay, I see. Thank you. Um, if uh, I guess a follow up question to that is um, for the New Mexico flight, do you think um, a high like which one would have a higher chance of success if we had had a, a, a swappable part? Or if we just use the the slots because um, to like take out the deployable fin system and just use the same body tube um, and the same slots that we got for um, and if we use we would use that for our static fins. Um, I'd have to see the specifics of your design to see how you're swapping them out. I'd be concerned that it, unless you are going to truly epoxy the new fit the static fins into place in those slots and making it truly a one way replacement. I'm afraid that you wouldn't be able to build something that is strong enough to withstand flight forces under your 30K um, flight design. Okay, okay, sounds good. We will definitely um, take that into consideration and make it as strong as uh, we can. All right, uh, anything else relating to the deployable fins? Okay, well then we'll start going down the list. Uh, Andrew, I see you're here. This is Andrew from ISC. Um, I'll leave you for the end, um, but uh, but we'll we'll continue down. Uh, Dr. Ratz, I know you messaged me about the question that you had, and I know that you uh, you offered to meet in person. Uh, if you have any other questions, we can definitely meet in person. But this one should be pretty quick to answer if you've got the time. Um, no, I'd like to talk to you in person about it. I I I, I would like for everybody else to respond. Uh, okay. that is limited in time. So thank you for asking. But yeah, I'd like to talk to in person, listen to other people is more important. Of course, I'll uh, I'll send you a message then and we'll get something scheduled to meet uh, uh, this upcoming week or something like that. All right, so let's go down here. Uh, so that brings us to Rob and Bob. I'm not sure which one is first in the list, but whoever would like to go first, feel free. Dad, you want to go for it or shall I? I guess I, other the only thing I'd have was I really was glad to see if you are going to use the uh, deployable fins that so you've gone away from make them either an airfoil or curved. So that's a step in the right direction. But here again, I just think your flight would work fine with solid fins. And if you're going to go to solid fins and want to want them for thirty thousand feet then it's easier to do it while you're building them than trying to adapt something in a motel room or something between the two flights. So that's the only thing I'd be concerned with. All right. 
Thank you. You're welcome. All right, and what do you have for us, Rob? Um, your payload. Sure. You've shown twice a hybrid motor with a nozzle. Are you actually going to be firing a motor inside your experiment bay? No, so that's that's actually a, a bit misleading, that graph. I just wanted to show that the valve assembly was used in, a, uh, in an SRAD motor, um, and that's sort of our reason for doing it. Uh, we're not actually going to be making an SRAD motor for our payload. It'll just be uh, running this experiment, and we're just going to use a valve to control flow rate uh, for the reaction. And then where are the reactants going to go? Uh, so the reactants, uh, that'd be a question for Bethany, if you're still on the call. Yep, I'm here. So what I was thinking is that we'd have a reactant chamber. So the valve would let one reactant into another reactant that's already in the chamber, and that's where the reaction would happen. Okay, and then where do they go after they react? So after the react, you're gonna have a gas and you're gonna have a partial solid. They're gonna stay in the chamber and then that's something that we would deal with during recovery. We'd be able to get all of our results through um, just the sensors and everything we're gonna be doing. during. So, the it's a, so it's a constant volume reaction. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. So it's a constant volume reaction. Yes. Depending on how much of both reactant you put in, you're gonna get a constant volume out. Well, there's no flow, so it's a constant volume reaction. It's a constant volume combustion reaction. Mm -hmm. So y you should be able to calculate the uh, final pressures and temperatures of that reaction, ideally. But you're going to be running static tests on the entire thing on, under, on the ground so that you know your pressure chambers can take all of the forces involved. We'll definitely do testing on that pressure chamber, yes. Okay, real good. Um, let's see. Your um, your tender descenders on your um, recovery system, and I appreciate that's it's a hard diagram to try and draw out, and it was done freehand. The idea of running the um, connection lines within the nylon shot cord is an excellent idea. I applaud anybody whoever came up with that had a great idea. What you want to be very careful of, just because I know this diagram is only partial, it doesn't show everything, and I didn't see any di any full line diagrams, you want to be very careful on where you're putting your swivels. Because if you have a swivel that attaches to your shock cord with your wires inside it, and the wires don't also run through a swivel, because obviously they can't, they're electrical, um, now you have the opportunity for it to knot up and break at the point of the swivel. So that just becomes an issue. You might want to lay out a full lines diagram as part of your um, secondary presentation just to make sure everyone uh, involved has a clear idea of exactly how all your shot cords are going to be attached, what's going to have the opportunity to tangle with what, et cetera. All right. Uh, I'll let Alex know about that. It looks like he's not on the call anymore, but I'll be sure to ask him about that and make sure the swivels are positioned uh, correctly. Sure. I believe um, he had an exam as well. Yep. At one point it was mentioned using heat resistant epoxies. While I have no problem with that, please make sure you pay very good attention to the adhesive quality of those epoxies because typically as heat resistance increases, the adhesive strength of the epoxy decreases. So make sure you don't buy, find something like a JB Weld, which is incredibly heat resistant, is not actually very adhesive. So it's great for heat, doesn't hold together stuff as nearly as well as um, room temperature epoxy does. So just something to be aware of so that you are checking on that. All right. Um, your air brake system, um, are they going to retract as part of the standard flight protocol? Alia? I'm so sorry. Can you please repeat the question? Obviously, you're going to be deploying your air brakes at sometime uh, sometime before apogee obviously is it your plan that after apogee they will self-retract um i, I can uh, answer the question yes okay. yep that's done uh through the software side they're gonna not be receiving any signals after apogee uh and then they'll mm -hmm. also have the springs to pull them back into their uh into their closed position to not affect uh descent 
but the servo motor would obviously have to rotate them back in, correct? Yes, yes, correct. and that, yes. Is, that is part of the Okay, yeah, just because that. obviously that's a point where it could very easily get hung up or snagged um, on landing if they were deployed. And if you're trying to fly this again a second time, trying to make sure that your rocket is as damage capable as possible, where if you can retract those while you're still up in the air, that's going to be an excellent approach. Yeah, yeah. Um, what we, what uh, my end, because I'm the person that has to deal with the electrical board for this uh, side of things. A couple of solutions I ha had for this would be to uh, basically just set a timer for some amount of time where we know that we've already reached Apogee or whatever. And after that timer's gone off, or from launch, and then after that timer's gone off, just make sure, all right, if they're not closed, close them already. And uh, maybe if we, uh, maybe if, depending on the complexity of the control loop that's done on a uh, different board, it may be able to say, all right, uh, we've reached Apogee, everything's done, close everything up. Excellent. Okay. Um, on your booster fins, um, and maybe it was just a limitation of the diagram. Yep, there you go. Why is there only a partial root on that fin instead of being full length? Oh, um, that was something I'll have to figure out, Kurt, but I... Couldn't figure because it's uh, with the trapezoid design that was as long as I could make it currently without it going outside of the fins, if you know what I'm saying. I don't know. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I yeah, think I, that's uh, just a limitation because he is a new member learning how to design in CAD, so we'll just have to help him out. That's, that's, yes. that's totally fair. My there's no, there's a way. Is, um, we can fix that to make it because cool. your fin roots are the primary means that you're using to transfer force from your motor tube to your airframe the longer you can make them the greater force your those fins are able to transfer for you you don't want to rely on your centering rings for force transfer that's what your fin roots are best at because they're mounted along the line of force instead of across it so if you can lengthen those, assuming that your design allows you to lengthen them, you are able to then um, have more adhesion points to be able to transfer force along them. It's just a thought. All right, I'll make sure I fix that. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, you flip to page 108, if you would. Of course. Okay. The switches that are being talked about with sand and dirt entering the switches, where are these switches? Uh, the switch will be mounted um, uh, off of the cube set on the top of the uh, the camera mount frame. These are non-critical switches, by the way. They're just for the electronics for the payload. Okay. What I was concerned about is the pressurized air canister because anything with an altimeter in it, you're going to destroy just before you launch it by firing a can of air into the bay that holds that pressure sensor. They're not strong enough to take the pressure changes that you would bring into play if you fired a can of air into that hole and pressurized and then all of a sudden depressurized that bay with a can of air. All right. Yeah, uh, for these switches, there's no altimeter in that region. Uh, and part of how the switch mount is set up, uh, it's got its own little mount, so it'd be contained in there. But we'll make sure to stay away from pressurized air uh, okay. for cleaning those. You know, tape the, tape the hole over or something like that is probably a much less invasive way of trying to keep sand and dirt out of your switch holes. All right. Thank you. Um, page 111, uh, you talked about checking your separation charges. What specifically would you be checking on them? I can I can take this. Uh, I think this might have been a a bit of a typo there because we checking the actual black powder charges wouldn't do anything to it. Uh, we just want to make sure that the altimeters, either the RC two and the RC three, are programmed correctly. Uh, so for the RC two, making sure the dip switches are in correct uh, positions, uh, and then for the RC three, making sure we can get the uh, correct beep codes for indicating the function. Okay, but please know you can continuity check those separation charges before yeah. you put black powder into the burritos with them. 
And I would strongly encourage you when you talked about checking separation charges, I was hoping that somebody would say, sure, we're going to check them for electrical continuity. Because if you have a, um, a break in your electrical, um, your matches aren't going to fire. Right. I'm with you. Okay, great. Last question. And by the way, I, the shortness, the directness of this, I'm really impressed. You guys have continued to make excellent progress. I, I, for whatever it's worth from some guy who comes and bugs you a couple of times a year over the internet, um, I'm really impressed with this presentation. You guys have been doing a, you're continuing to um, get better every single time you do this. For your 30K launch, who you got for a sponsor? For funding? No, no, you've got to have a level three flyer sponsor your flight. Oh, I've got you. Um... Well, in that case, I guess it would be either you, Rob, or if I got my level three in time, it would be me. Okay. Just be aware, I wasn't, I, I don't know where your flight is. I'm assuming you're talking about Airfest or something like that in Argonia. It I is. had not planned on going to that, and you would have to have whoever your sponsor is actually be there. Um, but you want to make sure you find out what the um, RSO requirements are for that event when you're putting up a big complex rocket like this. All right. And um, make sure you're making them happy. Yep, I'll have to take a look. I hadn't considered that, actually. Thank you for letting me know. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have to see if the requirement is just a level three. You know, hopefully I will have my level three by then, so uh, we won't have to uh, worry about it. But if there's more requirements, I'll let you know, and we'll see if we can sort something out. Sounds good. I'm done. Thank you. All right. Uh, let me see. Uh, Malik, I think I accidentally skipped you when I was going down the list. My, my apologies. Any other questions you have? I see you went unmuted, but I can't hear you. Can Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, my microphone had gone off. Um, yeah, it was just another general question. I, I may have missed it, but your general airframe, what is the exterior surface made out of? Is that also carbon fiber? Uh, this is, well, actually, I can have somebody else answer this. Uh, who do we want? Andre, what's our airframe made of? Hi, so yeah, our airframe is uh, completely made of uh, fiberglass. Yeah. A filament run fiberglass specifically. Yep, okay, I think the, cool. the technical specification of it is G10 fiberglass. Uh, we just buy it cots, but uh, like Sierra mentioned, we are hoping to make our own in the future um, with a filament winder once we can get one. Okay, is that a part of your structural, is that taking structural load too, or is it just purely an aerodynamic for it? Sure. So uh, the motor, one of the big things with the motor is we're trying to transfer that force into the airframe. So it is, it is taking load. Okay. The skin is as well. Okay, yep. cool. Um, okay. Yep. That's just it. All right. Uh, any other questions in the crowd at all? Feel free to speak up. Andrew, I don't know if you have any questions as well. All right, well, I'm going to stop the recording here uh, for the presentation and we'll put this portion on YouTube.